standard network rate message or post your name and number to GB03 PO Box 8690 Derby DE1 9 double T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5 p.m. on Friday, the 29th of March. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if watching or listening on demand. Good luck. Big news, big debates, big opinion. Patrick Christie's Tonight is the week's biggest show. Every weekday, 9 to 11 p.m., we've got the inside track on the day's top stories. There'll be sharp takes you won't get anywhere else. We will set the news agenda, not just follow it, and I want to bring you along for the ride. Whatever it is, we'll have our finger on the pulse. It's news, but it's this close to entertainment. Patrick Christie's Tonight, 9 to 11 p.m., only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Gloria DiPiero, bringing you PMQ's live here on GB News. Whenever Parliament is in session on a Wednesday at midday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's questions. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister. And we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels. We're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. Good morning and welcome to Sunday with Michael Portillo. This is Palm Sunday and for Western Christians, the start of Holy Week, the most solemn of the year. An eye-catching poll by YouGov this week suggested that the Reform Party might have overtaken the Tories amongst male voters. How do the Conservatives respond to that challenge? Are elections won on the centre ground by appealing to the broadest number of people or is the electorate crying out for a mainstream party that will take more effective positions on immigration and law and order? To answer that question, I have an excellent political panel. The world is a disorderly place at the moment with wars and terrorism. Without fanfare and with little criticism, China increasingly crushes dissent in Hong Kong, once a city of free speech. Its government has imposed so-called national security laws to suppress all opposition, whilst the Chinese Communist Party continues to harass dissidents overseas. As my guest, the Hong Kong pro-democracy campaigner Finn Lau will explain. China was the elephant in the room when Foreign Secretary Lord Cameron and Defence Secretary Grant Shapps visited Australia to cement increased security cooperation between London and Canberra. Britain's BAE Systems will co-build Australia's new fleet of nuclear-powered submarines. I'll speak to the former Australian High Commissioner to the United Kingdom, now National Security Professor at Australian National University, George Brandis. And from our global tour, we'll return to London and the world of theatre, as Stefan Kiriazis brings us his reviews of the latest productions. All of that to come. First, your news headlines with Aaron Armstrong. Thanks, Michael, and a very good morning to you. It is two minutes past 11. I'm Aaron Armstrong. Russians are observing a national day of mourning after at least 133 people were killed in a terror attack on Friday. People have been lighting candles and laying flowers at the concert hall in the outskirts of Moscow, where four men with automatic weapons opened fire in a packed auditorium. Flags have been lowered to half-mast, events cancelled, and advertising taken off state television, with some countries lighting up landmarks in solidarity. 
President Putin has suggested, without evidence, Ukraine was involved, despite Islamic State claiming responsibility, which has been backed up by US intelligence. Ukraine has dismissed Russia's claims as absurd. Well, the White House condemned the attack as heinous and described Islamic State as a common terrorist enemy that must be defeated. Meanwhile, Ukraine's been hit by a series of Russian attacks overnight. Sirens in Kyiv as residents sought shelter in subway stations. Ukrainian authorities say they shot down 18 missiles and 25 drones over the capital. Dozens of Russian missiles also targeted critical infrastructure in the western region of Lviv. Amid reports, one missile crossed the border into Polish airspace, a Poland, a NATO member. The whole country has been placed on alert. At least 10,000 civilians have been killed in Ukraine since Russia's invasion. The Prince and Princess of Wales have said they're enormously touched by the kind messages of support. Catherine announced her cancer diagnosis on Friday and revealed she's started preventative chemotherapy. A statement from Kensington Palace also said the couple are grateful the public understand their request for privacy. The Chancellor's defended the government's record on housing affordability after suggesting a salary of £100,000 wasn't much if you're living in South West Surrey. Jeremy Hunt says salaries may appear large, often go, don't go very far amid higher house prices and the rising cost of living. And the average home now costs around eight times the typical income compared to the 1990s when it was four times the average pay. The Chancellor told uh, GB News' Camilla Tomini lower taxes will make a difference. The average house price is in that part of the world £670,000. Mm. If you've got a mortgage, if you're paying childcare, um, what looks like a very high salary doesn't go as far as you might think it would. If you look at the average salary in this country, £35,000, um, they have been feeling the pinch and those people will see their tax bills go down by £900 this yeah. year. If you look at people on an even lower salary, uh, the lowest legally payable salary, the national living wage, because I've increased that to £11.44, they will see if they're working full-time, their income go up by £1,800. However, Labour Party Chair Annalise Dodds says tax rises are to blame and promised the Labour government would bring change. You know, there's a big difference, Camilla, between what Labour is setting out, especially on taxation, and what we're seeing under the Conservatives. We've seen taxes going up 25 times under the Conservatives. Our instinct is always to make sure that working people are not paying the price for government mistakes. That's what's happened, I'm afraid, under the Conservatives. So, of course, our approach would always be to try and reduce that impact on working people. We've seen the opposite, I'm afraid, under recent Conservative governments. Three young siblings reported missing from Gloucestershire have been found safe and well. Officers had been concerned for the welfare of three-year-old Polly, five-year-old Jolene and eight-year-old Betsy, who are under a court order that prevents them from being in the care of their parents. They went missing after last being seen with their mother on Friday. A woman's been arrested on suspicion of child neglect and remains in police custody. And Simon Harris is expected to become the new leader of Ireland's Fine Gael party, putting him on track to take over as the country's next prime minister. It follows the surprise resignation of Leo Varadkar on Wednesday for what he described as personal and political reasons. At the age of just 37, Mr Harris will become Ireland's youngest Taoiseach. He's expected to be formally elected in April after the Easter recess. You can get more on all of our stories by signing up to our alerts. QR screen is on your, co on your screen right now. Uh, or go to gbnews.com slash alerts. Now it's back to Michael. Thank you, Aaron Armstrong. Now, which of these two propositions is more true? One, elections are won on the centre ground. The Tories are losing because they're perceived to have abandoned it. The great danger for them is that after their defeat, they'll move to the right again, as they did under Hague and Howard, and remain in the wilderness. Or two, the public is in despair with both main parties, neither of which addresses its main concerns, including immigration. That's proved by the lack of enthusiasm for either party and the strength of reform. 
Boris proved that the Tories need to be populist, and events in other European countries show that centrist parties must grab the territory of parties to their right. Which of those two do you agree with? Well, to answer the question, which is the conundrum that will face the Tories after their defeat, I have a youthful panel of Conservative thinkers. Johnny Luck is the Conservative prospective parliamentary candidate for Milton Keynes Central. Alice Denby is opinion and features editor at City AM. And Charlie Rowley is a former advisor to Michael Gove. Uh, Alice, uh, w welcome to all of you. Back to the programme. Alice, let's begin with you. Which of those two propositions fires you up more? I think you've got to think of the reason why you're asking me that question. Why have the Tories' fortunes reversed so dramatically since 2019? And I think the reason for that is that in 2019, the Conservative Party reoriented itself towards a section of voters who are not fundamentally Conservative. They were... Um, uh, anti-establishment voters who wanted Brexit to be delivered. It then followed that with a policy platform that was, again, fundamentally unconservative. Levelling up was a big spending, um, socially conservative agenda that was essentially intellectually moribund. Uh, and the third reason is because they put in place a leader in Boris Johnson uh, who was completely unsuitable for the job. And that is the reason why the Tories are be doing so badly now. What they need to rediscover uh, following what looks likely to be a major defeat in this election, is the Conservative intellectual roots. The, what fires people up is a Conservative message that is about aspiration, choice, freedom. That is what they need to get back to. And this is something that you said after a, a, a previous major defeat in 1997 in a, a speech um, at Conservative Party conference, um, that the Conservative message is fundamentally a popular one. That's what they need to get back to. Fair enough, but the 2019 election under Boris, who was, who was a sort of populist, was, of course, a, an extraordinary result. And Brexit was a very controversial policy. It was, certainly wasn't a centrist policy. He divided the country in two. He campaigned on getting br Brexit done. So that would suggest that in that particular case, being off the centre ground and being pretty populist, was successful for the Tories. I think it would be to take completely the wrong lesson from 2019 if you think what we need is more of that, because clearly what has followed has been a disaster. That's a nice short answer. <laughs> um, uh, Charlie, where do mm. you stand on these two propositions? Centre ground or, or move to take territory away from the from the more radical parties? Yeah, I think you've got to um, uh, keep hold of the centre ground. I think that's um, uh, obvious because, as you were saying, Boris in 2019 was able to unite and level up the country, and that was what the campaign was, was all about. It was articulating a message to those Red Wall voters, people who'd never voted, as I was saying, never voted Conservative before, um, because Labour had left them behind. They had uh, voted to leave the EU because the EU wasn't working uh, for them. Uh, and um, I think that is where you will find the balance between the North and the South, the East and the West, uh, and you can be a unionist party, making sure that actually you've got um, uh, people in Scotland, in Wales, in Northern Ireland, uh, also, we can't forget about them, uh, who want to maintain the union of the UK, and that is a centrist view. That's not a left or a radical uh, right-wing uh, position to take. Um, and so I think um, when it comes to the campaign, it should be something similar of 2015, I would have thought, where David Cameron was able to, for the first time, increase a Tory majority by being very clear about the economic uh, issues that the country faced. It had to take very tough decisions in terms of austerity, but ultimately there was a message for everybody in that 2015 general election, whether it was 30 hours free childcare all the way through to the triple lock in pension guarantees for, uh, for the elderly. There was something for everybody in that campaign, and that's something that I think every political party would want to get back to, offering something for everybody in the constraints that you have in order to have a, uh, a, a united uh, a country and to have a, a centrist view, something for everybody that gets you uh, over the the finishing line to win a general election. But I feel I can hear some of our viewers shouting at the screen as you say this, and they will be saying, well, this centrism that you describe, which, by the way, affects the Conservatives, the Liberal Dem Democrats, Labour, the SNP, more or less everyone other than reform, actually, is leading to massive illegal immigration, massive legal immigration, and we, this is the viewer talking still, we are fed up with the fact that no one is going to give us effective policies on some of the things that matter to us most. Charlie. So I think that's I think that's absolutely right, and I think you can be um, uh, centrist as well as uh, dealing with the difficult decisions in isolation that you might face. So you know the number one issue in the country is the cost of living, um, and so making sure that you have an economy that works for everybody uh, is the number one priority for any government, whether it's an incoming or the, or the current one. Um, but you can still have a centrist platform as well as articulating the big challenges such as immigration, illegal migration, and that's why the government is um, is uh, uh, is articulating the 
five priorities that the Prime Minister has, one of which is the Rwanda bill, uh, to ensure that you can stop uh, the small boats. Anyone can articulate challenges. I think people want articulation of the solutions. Um, Johnny Luck, you are a practitioner in the sense that you will soon be seeking election to the House of Commons. Yep. How do you view my two propositions? Well, yeah, well look, it's, it's, it's dangerous for me to go into one lane, right? Uh, I think it's about where are the voters, right? And that's why... The... It's dangerous for you to go into one lane. Yeah, I, 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 we need, as a Conservative Party, we are the National Party and we have a very broad coalition of support and our job is to articulate that to a wide range of audiences. And that's why... Uh, you know, in our, our plan, free of it is about economics and economy and, and the cost of living, because that actually is the majority of what people care about, whether you see yourself on the left or right. And actually, I think people sitting on the sofa, they don't see themselves as right wing if they're concerned about immigration. I think a lot of people across the country are, care about immigration. So I think those issues are very important. And as we get closer to the election, and this is where I do challenge the a perception that the Conservatives are down and out. I think we have a very good chance of doing very well in the general election. It's because the choice will be very clear soon about where do we stand and where does Labour stand. The second observation is that I, I agree that the election will be more like 2015 in the sense that's not a snap election. So it's going to be a lot more on the local issues. And local issues will matter in different regions with, on different issues, on immigration is one, but also on planning reform is a huge one. Milton Keynes, Labour wants to put 63,000 houses, which is very unpopular. And so Labour has a challenge there because they, they want to bro broaden out their own coalition, but their policy platform, I think, once it hits reality, will also be a problem. And I think that's an issue beyond just being in the centre or being in the centre-right. Do your prospective constituents think that they're being well served, not just by the Tory party, but by both main parties, if they are, and I expect many of them are, deeply worried about illegal and even legal immigration. Yeah, I, I think in general, people are frustrated. They're frustrated partly because of immigration, but it's also the result of the pandemic and the cost of living crisis and then the perception of, oh, there are people jumping the queue and getting support when they shouldn't be. And, you know, my job and the job of, the, of politicians is to make sure we articulate the better story, which is that illegal immigration is coming down. And we've had an extraordinarily difficult challenge in terms of the economy, which is hopefully now seeing the light. We're seeing tax cuts, etc. We need to articulate that story. But it's also about relativism. Like, what is our offer compared to the other parties' offer at a very pra pragmatic, real-life level? At the moment, you know, the Reform Party are saying lots of things. But how does it actually work in real life? And that's the same with the Labour Party. What are they going to say? Voters are not stupid. They're going to sit down on the day and go, how is it actually going to happen? And then when that happens, when we see that, we'll see actually, I don't, I'm not sure many political parties have the solution. I think the Conservative Party has the best solution. Yeah. Uh, Alice, in your first answer, you were stressing the importance of getting back to Conservative values. Um, but where do you see this immigration question lying? I mean, how could the Conservatives, either before or after what we suppose will be an election defeat, convince the electorate that they had a policy for dealing with immigration? Or do you not think it's that important? I do think it's very important. And I think I, I want to say, when we talk about centrism, I think what we mean is a party that can command the centre ground, but also that can kind of contain and neutralise its more radical fringes. That is why, fundamentally, the Labour Party is going to win this next election, because they have been able to neutralise the far left. But I think you're right. I think when they come to government, they will struggle to put forward a credible policy on immigration, and that issue will continue to be very divisive for voters. I think what the Conservatives need to do is have a credible plan, and not just on illegal migration, but on legal migration, which has surged under policies that they deliberately designed post-Brexit. So they need to have a credible policy for that. And if you can be credible, and if you can have a Conservative message that is, we want to control our borders, but we want to let in the best and brightest, we, we want to do what's right for the economy, and we want to be compassionate to refugees, that is how you can have a kind of hold the centre ground, but also contain the more what you call radical forces that you do see in some of the support for reform that perhaps is more about racism. Um, you need to be credible on it. You need a proper policy. Um, Charlie, uh, at the end of your last answer, you were talking about Rwanda. You really believe that Rwanda is going to sort out the illegal immigration problem, do you? Uh, I think it's part of the solution. I don't think on its own, um, uh, planes taking off and, and taking a, a small number of people over uh, to Rwanda, but it is part of a huge uh, deterrent to stop people coming over. I think it will work, but I think you have to have the cooperation with France to stop people coming over in the first place. You've got to bust those criminal gangs. Uh, you've got to make sure that border force and the processing of people is you know, sped up to make sure that people that come into this country legally, that they are uh, returned to, you know, uh, with, including return agreement with Albania and many other countries. So in isolation, I don't think anyone's suggesting that, you know, Rwanda on its own
alone will uh, be the, uh, the the silver bullet. But I think um, in combination of all these other factors, I think it will be something that actually the public will um, reward Rishi Sunak for because no other Home Secretary, no other Prime Minister has been able to tackle this issue. And once you see planes take off, I think people will say, oh, well, fair play, Rishi, well done. Uh, uh, Johnny, are you very conscious that if you are elected as a, as a member of Parliament, I'm afraid the likelihood is that you'll be in opposition according to the opinion polls. But one of the first things you might have to do if you were in opposition would be to decide collectively what would be the direction of the party. Are you ready for that responsibility? And, and do you know how you would express yourself in that choice? <laughs> That's a good attempt. Of course, I think we're going to do fine and great in the general election. Um, it is very important, no matter what happens, that we keep that very broad coalition of support. Um, we are in a serious party. You know, we, we've done a lot of amazing things and we need to make sure we, we emphasise the pragmatism uh, and, and the pro-business mantra, which I think is very popular. Uh, again, I, I genuinely don't know what Labour stands for. Their economic policies don't add up at all on apprenticeships. It's going to cost the country billions on net zero. They want to decarbonise the grid by 2030 without the money for it. It doesn't make any sense and voters will catch that. So those are the issues. Now, if... You know, I don't want them to be in government. If they get into government, those issues will still be there. They will still have to answer it. And my job will be to hold them to account. Uh, but we're going to be in government, don't worry. Good. <laughs> Massive confidence. Um, thank you to Charlie Riley, Alice Denby and uh, Johnny Luck. Now, another week, I shall pose a question that faces the Labour Party with a panel of thinkers on the political left. In a few minutes, I'll be joined by the Hong Kong democracy campaigner, Finn Lau to discuss the latest repressive laws that are squeezing out all dissent in the former British colony. Stay with us, please. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Can the Church of England not spend their money as they wish? The Church of England can do amazing things for this country and for the world. And I'm not sure why it's chosen to focus on this specific issue. You know, one of the causes that I've always thought the church was very good at were things called almshouses, which were basically houses that would be built on church estates for the needy. Not only did they want to spend £100 million on this fund, that they wanted to spend £1 billion on reparations as well. But why not spend... 100 million or a billion pounds on a new generation of almshouses as opposed to just helping one group of people, black British people, why not just help all people in need? Alex? Well, I, I just don't understand what the Church of England is trying to do. It's on its deathbed. Congregations have, have reduced. Reduced. I mean, deathbed is maybe a I mean, well, if we look over 20 years, it's dramatically lower than it used to be. And, and, and a lot of criticism from actual Christians come from the, the values that the Church of England are now propagating. And Justin Welby has a lot to answer for because, you know, not only are we seeing in the news this mass conversion of illegal immigrants to a gay mass system in the UK, but now we're seeing them spending money... And, and as Albie actually pointed out correctly, it, it, in, in, a, in a way that doesn't really benefit broader society, it benefits a very small group of people. So I, I just don't know where it's going to end. This committee has also said one million is not enough. 100, it's 100 million, sorry. Um, it's, the, it, church commissioners are now hoping to, for a target of one billion. I mean, I mean it's, it's, a... it's woke nonsense, isn't it? You could make the argument that this is charity. Austin Welby's job is to be a virtue, should, virtue should, signaler, well, is it charity not? charity discriminate? I mean, that's what he's saying. We're only going to give this to people from a specific skin colour or background. I don't think that's it, it very Christian of them. Big news, big debate, big opinion. Patrick Christie's Tonight is the week's biggest show. Every weekday, 9 to 11 p.m., we've got the inside track on the day's top stories. There'll be sharp takes you won't get anywhere else. We will set the news agenda, not just follow it, and I want to bring you along for the ride. Whatever it is, we'll have our finger on the pulse. It's news, but it's this close to entertainment. Patrick Christie's Tonight, 9 to 11 p.m., only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel.
Welcome back. In Hong Kong, a new law has come into force, cloaked in the bureaucratic title of Article 23. The repressive legislation includes very vaguely worded propositions on actions such as secession and subversion. The Foreign Office has warned travellers to Hong Kong of the dangers that the law presents. Someone who knows about those dangers all too well is pro-democracy campaigner Finn Lau, who joins me now. Uh, Finn, uh, welcome to GB News. Tell me, what, what does the new law mean? I would say that the 2020 Hong Kong National Security as well as the latest, the 2024 Safeguarding National Security, actually it means that all UK citizens could be affected because it is extraterritorial in nature. It applies to activities outside of Hong Kong. As long as you criticise the Hong Kong authorities or the Beijing regime or the Chinese Communist Party, then you could file such a law. So a UK citizen with no connection in his or her history to Hong Kong could find himself or herself in peril from this law? Yes, it inc also includes social media posts. So in Hong Kong, uh, in the UK right now, we got over 180 Hong Kong migrants. So uh, actually this law is particularly affecting all uh, those migrants here in the UK. Let's for the moment focus on what it will mean in Hong Kong. Does it mean that all dissent, all criticism has been snuffed out in Hong Kong? Yes, I would say that because of these two national security law uh, in Hong Kong and Beijing, actually there have been, well, the civil liberties, which was guaranteed under the Sino-British Joint Declaration, have been undermined. The civil society have been further collapsed. There is no uh, independent judiciary system in Hong Kong anymore. What has happened to the people who, like you, were campaigning? Well, there are lots of incidents happened since 2019. So back in 2019, we got over 2 million people marching on the street of Hong Kong. And then, well, since then, I would say that the awareness towards the Beijing regime has been increased. On the other hand, well, because there are so many people advocating uh, about human rights and democracy in Hong Kong, I would say that we are facing transnational repression issue. For instance, I was attacked and followed by uh, suspicious people in the UK, in London, during the lockdown period, and I was beaten up as well. On the other hand, I was approached by some fake journalists before. Um, so you think there are Chinese agents operating in the United Kingdom and, and indeed elsewhere in Europe and across the world, um, looking at, um, keeping an eye on people like you? Yes, true. Uh, well, for instance, uh, I have uh, a documentary being produced, uh, say, last autumn, and then I was uh, approached by fake journalists who want to understand more about the, well, the twinning campaign between Chinese cities and UK cities. And there was a tourist claim to be, there was a Chinese claim to be tourist uh, to broke into my uh, briefing session at the parliament as well. Um, how many of your former colleagues find themselves in prison at the moment? Well, it's very difficult to count the exact number, but in Hong Kong right now, we've got more than 10,000 political arrests. We've got more than 16,000 political prisoners serving more than 100 years of total, life, uh, total length of imprisonment. This is even more, uh, longer than Iran. Can we expect more people, as you did, to come to Britain on their British national overseas passports from Hong Kong as this repression bites? Well, I would say that the British national overseas uh, passport is one of the UK passport and is a, well, somehow is a historical responsibility for the UK government to take care of the former colony. And under this uh, visa scheme, I would say that uh, more than 1,800, uh, 180,000 uh, Hong Kong migrants have been benefited. And we are very grateful for this. Because of this BNO visa scheme, we are able to talk about Hong Kong issues. We could uh, somehow voice out our opinions. Although we are facing threats such as the latest security law, but we are so grateful for this. Um, there have been instances, have there, of um, so-called dissidents, I mean, people who have been campaigning for democracy, actually being kidnapped in Europe? Yes, uh, well, technically not in Europe, but in Asian countries. So we got a Hong Kong slash Swedish citizen, Guan Man ah. Hoi, who got kidnapped in Thailand because of his, well, so-called, well, stance towards the Beijing regime. Um, if you went back to Hong Kong now, what would happen to you? Well, if I went back to Hong Kong, uh, if I go back to Hong Kong now, I could be put into jail for the rest of my life simply because 
of my policy efficacy for human rights, democracy, as well as sanction and other issues. So this is also applicable to all the other Hong Kongers, not just myself. So or maybe even more than Hong Kongers as well, because as I have mentioned just now, as long as you are criticizing the Hong Kong government, you are violating such a law. So that's why yeah, it is very, very ambiguous. May I ask you, why did you choose to, to be an advocate? Why did you not choose a quiet life? You could be living quietly in Hong Kong, you could have said nothing at all, but you've chosen to be an advocate, which has obviously affected your life enormously because you've had to move your place of abode and, and you're in a certain amount of danger, as you say. Why did you make that choice? Well, same as so many different people, I used to work for the construction industry, working for the infrastructure sector. But then back in 2019, I just feel that, well, I, I should have the backbone to say no to the dictatorship in Beijing. That's why I stand up. And then since then, I try to propose different kind of policy, such as sanctions, uh, and human rights in Hong Kong. Also, on the other hand, well, I would say that security in the UK is also being threatened by the ads of Beijing. We should, well, somehow uh, counter this kind of uh, encroachment by the Beijing regime here in the UK. Well, um, Fin Lao, I, um, I really believe you do have backbone and I uh, congratulate you upon it. Thank you very much indeed. Well, we'll continue to focus on China after the break as it provides the subtext to the British Foreign Secretary's visit to Australia this week where a new deal was struck. British industry will help to build nuclear-powered submarines for the Royal Australian Navy. Stay with us. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Now, what's going on in Scotland? So they're implementing these draconian hate speech laws, which are going to come in into force on April the 1st, I kid oh, you ironically, not. Ironically, yeah. And then, um, basically, you can go to your local mushroom shop or whatever. Which I didn't know we had mushrooms farms in Scotland no. because people aren't that keen on vegetables up the road. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, not even a shiitake. But, um, but you can report a hate crime at these private... But you can do it anonymously, and then the police will, uh, I don't know, unleash the hate monster. I, I don't know what, how this works. What's going on? I think the hate monster... <laughs> <laughs> is mythical, yes. and um, I don't think the hate monster actually exists. What I do think is existed. I'm genuinely really worried about comedy, right? Yeah. Now, believe it or not, some people in Scotland, they're wrong, but they don't like me. Yeah. And I genuinely feel that a lot of time is going to be wasted. You know, if someone yeah. calls you a name in a shop, you probably deserved it, believe me. Um, also, called... comedy can be quite offensive, particularly yours. And I'm not necessarily sure. As I've said on the show before, I remember my mum was worried when we, we, Scotland had decided that all um, residential properties needed special smoke alarms, and my mum was convinced this was to do with the hate crime and that there was a camera in them. And... <laughs> I, 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 I don't think she's being that paranoid. I mean, it, Scotland is a kind of nanny state. You know, actually, Hamza Youssef, when he implemented the hate crime bill, put a, a subsection in that which said that they can criminalise you for things you've said in the privacy of your own home. Thankfully, Scotland doesn't have the largest arts festival in the world. Oh, wait, oh, no, it does, no. it does. It actually does have that. And lots of comedians are up there. Now, we had this before, because if you go back about to, uh, to 2000 and, what was it, 2003, when New Labour were trying to push through their racial and religious hate crime bill, well, the comedians are silent now. Something has completely changed. There's been a gear shift. Oh, I mean, in the Irish hate crime bill, which is which is going through at the moment, they actually define hatred as hatred. Brilliant. It's a complete circular definition. Well, well, yeah, well, absolutely. And that tells me when something's woolly, that tells me that it's not going to be applied fairly. It's going to be applied according to the person applying it. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Gloria De Piero, bringing you PMQ's live here on GB News. Whenever Parliament is in session on a Wednesday at midday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's questions. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister. And we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's live here on GB News, Britain's election channel.
Welcome back. The Foreign Secretary, Lord Cameron, and the Defence Secretary, Grant Shapps, were in Australia last week, signing a deal to enhance UK-Australian security cooperation. Australia will spend almost £2.5 billion in Rolls-Royce nuclear facilities here in the United Kingdom to expand Rolls-Royce's nuclear reactor facilities, to supply submarines that will be built by a BAE Systems joint venture with Australia. It's an extension of the so-called AUKUS Pact between the US, Australia and the United Kingdom, signed in 2021. Here to explain its significance is George Brandis, former High Commissioner to the United Kingdom and now Professor of National Security at Australian National University. Uh, George, it's very nice to see you. Welcome to GB News. Thank you for coming on from, I think you're in Sydney, are you? I am, Michael. Good morning. Good to see you again, too. Good to see you. Um, why has Australia and its allies chosen to build nuclear-powered submarines. Why is that seen as the priority? Because the government of the day uh, under Prime Minister Morrison uh, concluded that the, uh, the, the capability of this particular platform was vastly greater uh, than the diesel-powered submarines that Australia had previously intended to build. Uh, the United States had been supplying uh, the nuclear propulsion technology to the United Kingdom ever since 1958. But uh, until 2021, the UK was the only country to which um, the US Navy was prepared to supply the nuclear, nuclear propulsion technology. Uh, and the decision to include Australia uh, as a partner in the sharing of the nuclear propulsion technology was a great game changer. And at a time when uh, the strategic rivalry um, in the Indo-Pacific is becoming more intense with no likelihood in the foreseeable future that it will become less intense, it was absolutely critical for Australia to have this much greater uh, and capability and this much more effective weapons system. What, what facilities will these uh, nuclear submarines, nuclear-powered submarines, carry? And how many of them will there be? There are, they will be conventionally armed but nuclear powered. Um, and there will be between eight and ten. Uh, there is a, this is a, a genuine uh, tripartite partnership between uh, the United Kingdom, the United States and Australia. Uh, the, early, uh, uh, the, the earliest of the submarines to be delivered from the early 2030s will be the US Virginia class submarines. Um, while the British capability to jointly build um, with Australia a, an entirely new class of nuclear-powered um, submarines, uh, the SSN AUKUS, uh, scales up. And the um, agreement that was signed in Adelaide uh, by Australian and British ministers this past week um, is a very, very important step along the road uh, by um, Australia investing um, in Australian uh, uh, dollar terms, 4.7 billion Australian dollars, um, to enable Rolls-Royce uh, to expand uh, its production capability in Derby uh, to provide the nuclear reactors which will power these submarines. If the British example is anything to go by, they might carry torpedoes, they might carry cruise missiles, they might be adapted for special forces use. Uh, is that the sort of uh, range that you're considering in Australia? Um, I think all uh, the, the, the traditional weapon systems associated with um, uh, um, submarines um, uh, are, are under consideration, um, certainly uh, torpedoes. Um, but uh, I don't want to go too far down the track because this is obviously a, a, a project with a very long, um, a, a very, uh, that will come together over a very long period of years and no doubt thinking uh, by uh, our respective navies about the most suitable weapon systems uh, for these vessels to uh, to carry uh, will um, emerge during the during the period of development. Um, let's just mark how historic this is. I mean, it is an extraordinary expression of togetherness between uh, the United Kingdom and Australia to be embarked together on this project, is it not? Uh, two countries are opposite well, sides of the globe. It, it certainly is. And it's also um, uh, both an expression of great trust in one another, um, both in terms of um, the, the security of the nuclear secrets and also 
in Australia's capability to ultimately uh, build these vessels um, in Adelaide, where uh, the BAE, BAE is developing a new facility uh, to build the vessel. So the nuclear reactors will be entirely constructed in the United Kingdom, but the, the final build of the SSN AUKUS um, will largely be in Adelaide. Uh, but what it also represents, Michael, and I think this is even more important, is a recognition of our, by our three countries that our strategic interests will not diverge in the long term. Because if we have a common weapon system, uh, as we will, developed literally over decades and then deployed for decades uh, later, that represents a judgment by your government, my government and the, uh, the American administration that for decades to come, there will be a commonality of interest between our three democracies. And I think that's a wonderful thing. Um, the United Kingdom does not compare with the United States in terms of capabilities. So why is it important to you to have the United Kingdom as part of it all? I think the United Kingdom's participation in AUKUS is absolutely crucial because I mean, there are some in Australia who say, well, why didn't you just buy all the submarines from the, from the Americans? As you say, Michael, um, America's um, submarine uh, industry capability is... Uh, on a significantly um, a bigger scale than Britain's. But I think both for strategic and practical reasons, that was the suboptimal choice. For strategic reasons, uh, because it is better that there be three partners than two, and particularly with the tilt to the Indo-Pacific, which has become such an important feature of your foreign policy since the integrated review, that fits very well. There are practical reasons as well. It increases Australia's weight in this arrangement to have it as a tripartite relationship with Britain as the third part party, rather than merely Australia, a relatively small nation of 27 million people, being entirely dependent on the United States, on one partner, um, to deliver these submarines. So uh, it's, it's a much more balanced partnership because of Britain's participation. Uh, George Brandis, I thank you very much for your very carefully considered words. Uh, great to talk to you. Uh, Stefan Kiriazis will be here after the break to review the latest productions, including a Royal Ballet Triple Bill. Stay with us, please. Hello, here's your latest weather update from the Met Office for GB News. Today looks much better, with plenty of sunshine across much of the UK, certainly a much brighter day than on Saturday. That's all thanks to a little ridge of high pressure moving in from the west, with low pressure now moving off uh, to the east of the UK. But notice further weather systems gathering out towards the west, and that will turn things more unsettled once again during the week ahead. Back to the detail now for the rest of the day. So plenty of sunshine around, just one or two showers feeding down from the north or northwest, particularly across northern parts of Scotland. Still a bit wintry here across the hilltops. But with lighter winds generally, more in the way of sunshine around, it should feel warmer out and about with temperatures up to 12 or 13 Celsius. 13 in London is 55 in Fahrenheit. As we go through the evening and during the overnight period, towards the north and east we'll see a lot of clear weather, the showers fading, turning quite chilly here with those clear spells. And without towards the west, it's starting to turn pretty wet, particularly across Northern Ireland, parts of Wales and the southwest of England, some heavy bursts of rain in places here by Monday morning. Temperatures down to two or three Celsius towards the north and east, so I say there will be a touch of frost by Monday morning. Was that towards the west, those temperatures start to rise, but that heralds a pretty wet day out across the west, and particularly down towards the southwest of England, could be some quite heavy rain at times here. And notice as that rain moves into colder air across Scotland, it will start to turn to snow, particularly on modest hills above about two or 300 metres. Could be a fair bit of snow here tomorrow night, with some heavy rain towards the east and southeast of the country too. Brighter skies down towards the southeast with 12 degrees. Big news, big debates, big opinion. Patrick Christie's tonight is the week's biggest show. Every weekday, 9 to 11 p.m., we've got the inside track on the day's top stories. There'll be sharp takes you won't get anywhere else. We will set the news agenda, not just follow it, and I want to bring you along for the ride. Whatever it is, we'll have our finger on the pulse. It's news, but it's this close to entertainment. Patrick Christie's tonight, 9 to 11 p.m., only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel.
I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Gloria DiPiero, bringing you PMQ's live here on GB News. Whenever Parliament is in session on a Wednesday at midday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's questions. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister, and we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels. We're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Welcome back. Now, during that break, Stefan Kiriazis has completed an arabesque and arrived in the studio. Stefan, I believe that... <laughs> Good morning, Michael. Is that actually an arabesque? No, <laughs> no I, thought, I thought not. Um, <laughs> I believe you've been to the ballet this week. I have, I have. I know you love that thing. So this is a celebration of Kenneth Macmillan, Royal Ballet's former director and chief choreographer for quite a while. And it's a triple bill, always as proverbial box of chocolates, mixed bag, but it kicks off with a 1955 piece, which was his debut, established him while he was still a dancer, to kind of transitioned more into becoming a choreographer. It's called Dance Concertant, which is music by Stravinsky. And Macmillan said he was inspired by the music's kaleidoscope of changing rhythms and moods. And it's very spiky, lots of changing direction, lots of pointing, not really for me. Um, it, it, the, the company, f for once, surprisingly, struggled a tiny bit with it. It was that's, that's one of the rare times I've seen them a little bit off form, but there have been illnesses. Second part is a cheery tale of a soldier plunged into despair and madness by army experiments and then a cheating mistress. Um, and it's based on Bruckner's Wojciech, um, which I believe is an opera as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it's heavy stuff stunningly danced, powerfully choreographed. The two leads on the night that I saw, Marcelina Sambe and Francesca Hayward, were gorgeous. But for me, it's the final piece. Requiem, written in uh, tribute to fellow choreographer John Cranko, who choreographed my all-time favourite, Onyegin. And it's called Requiem to Foray's piece. It's beautiful. It's all pale, white. Everybody's dressed in muted tones. It's inspired a little bit by William Blake pictures, religious iconography, so many complicated lifts. I don't know if we've been showing some pictures of them there. Absolutely stunning lifts and sort of tableaus, breathtaking. The final one is a one arm overhead with the girl standing vertical off the one arm. The and, whole uh, audience silent. Was that Francesca Hayward? No, uh, no, 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 that no, was wasn't. Leanne Benjamin. No, was it? Leanne Benjamin. Absolutely gorgeous. It's it's one of her, I think it's one of her signature pieces as well. She's absolutely stunning in it. That's on at the moment at the Royal Opera House until April the 13th and also in cinemas from April the 9th. So please do catch that. These triple bills are rather curious things, aren't mm. they? Because the material is so different one from another. Yes. So, you, you, obviously, you have an interval between each of them, but you come back to something wholly yes. contrasting yes. with what you saw before. Anyway, you obviously think the night was made by the Requiem oh, absolutely. At, at the end. Beautiful. Um, super. Uh, what else have we got? Uh, Henry something. Henry Clark. Harry Clark. Harry Clark. Or more precisely, Harry Clark. And this is another one. We're getting all these one-person shows at the moment. We've had Dorian yeah. Gray with Sarah Snook, which was Bells and Whistles. Uh, Andrew Scott doing Vanya. Now, this is Harry... Sorry, not Harry. This is Billy Crudup, American actor, who I admire greatly. Not a household name. Married to Naomi Watts. Brilliant actor, and it's just him in a folding chair sitting on stage. Um, and he's... It's, it's a little bit agitated at first. He's very twitchy, very nervy. He's Philip Brugelstein, an ageing camp gentleman, um, with a very strangled, weird British accent. It's a bit like Stewie from Family Guy. So he's all terribly, hello, my name is Philip Brugelstein. Uh, and he was a, a bullied child in Indiana, and he tells his life story who discovered this posh Brit alter ego. Mm. But at times, when he's being attacked, especially bullied by his father, Harry emerges. And Harry is... Think Michael Caine. It's like, my name is... Well, this is Harry Clark. Uh, 
and he kind of takes charge and, and gets Philip through difficult periods. And when he grows up and runs away to New York, complete hopeless failure until Harry makes a deal. Three months, Harry in charge, he's going to sort everything out. And it's a riot, a romp. He kind of gaslights and seduces this rich young Wall Street guy and his mother and his sister. And it's beautifully, hilariously done. Tells everybody he's Sade's manager, gets away with it, plays 19 characters. Uh, and there's been comments that it's a little bit too lightweight, that it doesn't really explore the whole talented Mr Ripley or Jekyll and Hyde angles. But for me, I disagree. Philip is not capable. It, he's so clenched, he's, so, he's been so damaged as a child, so fractured, that if he peels it away, there's a moment where he stares into a mirror and kind of screams, who am I? And he knows he's not doing nice, good things to this family. But also, he's completely lost. And so, for me, it ends, he's found some form of sanctuary and safety by the ending. I won't spoil it. And we just have to leave him be. And I don't like all this poking at it. And some people have criticised Billy's accents. And I'm like, that's the point. It's, it's not a flawless Cockney or a flawless... No, these are alter egos. And also, he's a failed actor kid from Indiana. Exactly. He's not supposed to be doing it perfectly. For me, entertaining, thrilling, I loved every second of it. Marvellous. Where is yes. it? This one is on, good point, Ambassador's Theatre until May the 11th. And I thoroughly recommend it. It's fun. Now, what else have you got for us? I've got a little clip for us um, from the sublime to the somewhat ridiculous Priscilla. Now, this was obviously the famous film, 1994, 2006 musical, and now we have Priscilla, the party where we can all take part. And there's a little clip we've got of it here. Back in the West End, the award-winning musical Priscilla, Queen of the Desert is now the ultimate party. Experience the glitz, glamour and unforgettable dance floor classics, including It's Raining Men, Girls Just Want to Have Fun, I Will Survive and many more. Unleash your inner diva at Priscilla the Party. Now, here was an outrageous movie, was there mm. not? And this looks like an outrageous follow-up. Yes, I'm, I'm waiting for your inner diva, Michael. But I, I, I noticed on the video, the first thing up it says is drink. So this, number one, solves this great problem that theatres have where they're desperately trying to get us all to stock up on drinks at intervals. This is... Um, it's more of a cabaret, open-plan form. So it's a little bit like Guys and Dolls. Stages move all around the mainly standing audience. There's a little bit of seating around. But the bars are open at the back, there's food being served at the back. It's more interactive, there is a little bit of audience participation, so keep your head down. Um, <laughs> I definitely would. Unless, unless, well, it's playing a young boy, so... <laughs> stretch for me. Um, but it's hugely, hugely entertaining. Now, it opens next week, so we're not reviewing yet, we're previewing. Mm -hmm. um, but it's massively entertaining. You saw that huge list of numbers, they've also worked in modern ones like Lady Gaga. It is the musical. So it's the 2006 musical. It's not just a bit of pop-up drag silliness. It's the full musical. There's a drag narrator, but then we go into the script from the musical, the scenes from the musical, all the changes, most of the songs from the musical. So for me, that, that's entertaining, and it's a different thing. It's, it's something for everyone to go, I would say, go with a pack of friends, have an absolute laugh and a night out, but it's celebratory. It's not a, a sort of formal piece of theatre. And I'm excited by this. It's at this new place called Outernet, Tottenham Court Road. If anyone hasn't been or people are visiting London, um, it's this huge thing above ground where you go in and you've got this 3D circular surround of all these huge screens that are always changing. You can just walk in and take pictures. It's extraordinary. Right opposite the new Soho Place Theatre. This is underground underneath. And it's a performance space also used for gigs, clubs. It's exciting. It's, it, it's this feeling of London renewing, different things coming in, and also a different way of going to the theatre or experiencing something. So this, for me, is very much kind of fun, participatory, with your friends. Um, and it's, it's, it's huge fun. I can't review review. No. Um, but... But, for example, if, if someone said to you, but I saw the movie, so I won't bother, you would presumably say, this is something completely different. Yeah, and also people would say, uh, you could say that the same about the, the musical as well. And the musical was hugely successful. I was a big fan of that. That toured all around the country as well. This is very much... This, this is the night out with friends type idea. And it's, it's again, theatre evolving, which I'm excited about. And this idea of all move, these moving stages. There's a bit of opera for you. And the, I have to say, 
without formally reviewing the, the vocals from the three girls that play the cockatoos. We won't go into the puns that come from that. Um, but three girls with stunning voices and they provide all the vocals. So there's no lip syncing like you get with drag queens. Um, the boys mouth some of the words, sing some of them. But then the girls are also doing the vocals and spectacularly well. We expect a long run. That's usually at the moment. It's an open run. So open it's run. booking right now. And I, I thoroughly, thoroughly <laughs> I recommend it without reviewing it. It's, it's just great fun and we need some fun. And now for something completely different. Mm. Player Kings. Some Shakespeare. So this is Henry IV, parts one and two. It's been adapted by Robert Not Icke. Not in their entirety. No. So merged. Robert Icke has kind of merged, repackaged, <clears throat> reformed. Modern setting, it's just been on at Manchester. It's coming to London next month in April. Then we're getting a, Euro a European, a UK tour to Bristol, Birmingham, Norwich and Newcastle all the way through till the end of July. The big draw, of course, Ian McKellen. So Ian McKellen is... Getting... As full staff. Yes, as full staff, yes. I, I, I think of Ian McKellen as a sort of wiry fellow and full staff as a, as a spherical well, figure. We've, we've, there we go, we've popped up a picture. <laughs> <laughs> you can't get more, more round than that. I, I would imagine a little bit of body padding going on or maybe he just had a, a very wonderful heavy Christmas. But um, yes, so it's McKellen. Uh, we're all reviewing that in a, in a couple of weeks. But I just wanted to say, because the, the tour dates are not that many nights in each place, so, and this will sell. All of his tours have sold out, and I can't recommend this highly enough. It's exciting. It, reworking Shakespeare, safe pair of hands, which, which is always good, um, and also getting people in wherever you are. So this one I'm really excited to see, and I really urge people to book wherever you are. Uh, Stefan, you've had a good week, haven't you? Because I mm. think everything you've uh, mentioned today, you've, uh, you've uh, enjoyed. Yes, I'm in, I'm in a better mood. I've got a couple of things which we won't... I've got something coming up next week that I'm hearing bad things around. Um, big, big name, but we'll just tease that for now. Um, but, yeah, I'm excited, and I'm excited by the breadth yeah. of things that are going on. We've also got a couple of returns coming in um, for black boys um, who contemplate... Um, and it's a heavy social issues. So there's there's lots of things around at the moment. It's exciting, Michael. Stefan, it's always exciting having <laughs> you in the studio. <laughs> Doing um, ballet. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, no, I enjoyed all your reviews very much. Well, you are watching Michael Portillo on GB News, GB's uh, Britain's news channel. I'll be back in a few minutes, and then we'll be de debating conversation for women who lost out on their pensions and the great escape, 80 years on. Don't go away. A brighter outlook with Bob Solar, sponsors of weather on GB News. Hello, here's your latest weather update from the Met Office for GB News. Today looks much better, with plenty of sunshine across much of the UK, certainly a much brighter day than on Saturday. That's all thanks to a little ridge of high pressure moving in from the west, with low pressure now moving off uh, to the east of the UK. But notice further weather systems gathering out towards the west, and that will turn things more unsettled once again during the week ahead. Back to the detail now for the rest of the day. So plenty of sunshine around, just one or two showers feeding down from the north or northwest, particularly across northern parts of Scotland. Still a little bit wintry here across the hilltops. But with lighter winds generally, more in the way of sunshine around, it should feel warmer out and about with temperatures up to 12 or 13 Celsius. 13 in London is 55 in Fahrenheit. As we go through the evening and during the overnight period, towards the north and east we'll see a lot of clear weather, the showers fading, turning quite chilly here with those clear spells. When we go towards the west, it's starting to turn pretty wet, particularly across Northern Ireland, parts of Wales and the southwest of England, some heavy bursts of rain in places here by Monday morning. Temperatures down to two or three Celsius towards the north and east, so I say there will be a touch of frost by Monday morning. Whereas well, out towards the west, those temperatures start to rise. But that heralds a pretty wet day out across the west, and particularly down towards the southwest of England, could be some quite heavy rain at times here. And notice as that rain moves into colder air across Scotland, it will start to turn to snow, particularly on modest hills above about two or three hundred metres. Could be a fair bit of snow here tomorrow night, with some heavy rain towards the east and southeast of the country too. Brighter skies down towards the southeast with 12 degrees. That warm feeling inside from Boxed Boilers, sponsors of weather on GB News.
Nation is ticking on your chance to win the Great British Giveaway. There's a massive £12,345 in tax-free cash to spend however you like, along with £500 in shopping vouchers for your favourite store, a games console, a pizza oven and a portable Sonos smart speaker. And the best news? You could be our next big winner just like Phil. Didn't quite believe it and still can't. Uh, and if I can win it, anybody can win it. For another chance to win the vouchers, the treats and £12,345 in tax-free cash, text GBWIN to 84902. Text costs £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB03 PO Box 8690 Derby DE1 9 T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5pm on Friday the 29th of March. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if watching or listening on demand. Good luck. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the people's channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. Good afternoon and welcome to the second hour of Sunday with Michael Portillo. Should those affected by changes in the government's pensions policy be compensated? A parliamentary ombudsman believes that women affected by a decision to raise their pension age from 60 to 65 should receive up to almost £3,000 due to the poor communication of the policy. That's prompted a backlash from certain younger observers who denounce pension protections as generational unfairness. We'll debate the issue. Today marks exactly 80 years since dozens of British prisoners of war made a daring escape from Stalag Luft III camp in Poland, a feat immortalised in the 1963 movie The Great Escape. I'll speak to Guy Waters, author of The Real Great Escape, who guides tours of the former prison camp about the real breakout which resulted in the recapture and the murder of many of the escapees. We'll also have expert commentary on the savage terrorist attack in Russia and whether it affects Moscow's ongoing war on Ukraine. All of that to come, but first your news headlines with Aaron Armstrong. Very good afternoon to you. It is a minute past 12. I'm Aaron Armstrong. Well, as you've just been hearing, Russians are observing a national day of mourning after at least 133 people were killed in a terror attack on Friday. People there have been lighting candles and laying flowers at the concert hall in the outskirts of Moscow. Four gunmen are among 11 people to have been arrested following the shooting. Flags have been lowered to half-mast, events cancelled and advertising taken off state television. 
with some countries lighting up landmarks in solidarity. President Putin has suggested, without evidence, Ukraine was involved, despite Islamic State claiming responsibility, which is backed up by US intelligence. Ukraine has dismissed Russia's claims as absurd. Meanwhile, the White House has condemned the attack as heinous and has described Islamic State as a common terrorist enemy that must be defeated. Well, Ukraine's been hit by a series of Russian attacks overnight. Sirens in Kyiv as residents were forced to seek shelter in subway stations. Ukrainian authorities say they shot down 18 missiles and 25 drones over the capital. Dozens of Russian missiles were also aimed at critical infrastructure in the western region of Lviv. Amid reports, one missile crossed the border into Polish airspace, which is a NATO member. The whole country has been placed on alert. At least 10,000 civilians have been killed in Ukraine since Russia's invasion. The Prince and Princess of Wales have said they're enormously touched by the kind messages of support. Catherine announced her cancer diagnosis on Friday and revealed she's started preventative chemotherapy. A statement from Kensington Palace also said the couple are grateful the public understand their request for privacy. The Chancellor has defended the government's record on affordable housing after claiming £100,000 a year is not a huge salary. Jeremy Hunt says it doesn't go as far as you would think for people in his Surrey constituency amid higher house prices and the rising cost of living. The average home now costs around eight times the average income. It was half that back in the 1990s. The Chancellor told Camilla Tomini lower taxes will make a difference. The average house price is in that part of the world £670,000. Mm. If you've got a mortgage, if you're paying childcare, um, what looks like a very high salary doesn't go as far as you might think it would. If you look at the average salary in this country, £35,000, um, they have been feeling the pinch, and those people will see their tax bills go down by £900 this mm. year. If you look at people on an even lower salary, uh, the lowest legally payable salary, the national living wage, because I've increased that to £11.44, they will see if they're working full-time, their income go up by £1,800. Well, the Labour Party chair, Annalise Dodd, says tax rises are to blame, and she's promised a Labour government will bring change. So there's a big difference, Camilla, between what Labour is setting out, especially on taxation, and what we're seeing under the Conservatives. We've seen taxes going up 25 times under the Conservatives. Our instinct is always to make sure that working people are not paying the price for government mistakes. That's what's happened, I'm afraid, under the Conservatives. So, of course, our approach would always be to try and reduce that impact on working people. We've seen the opposite, I'm afraid, under recent Conservative governments. A woman's been arrested on suspicion of child neglect after three young siblings went missing in Gloucestershire. Police confirmed the three-year-old boy and the girls, aged five and eight, are safe and well. They're under a court order that prevents them from being in the care of their parents, but went missing after last being seen with their mother on Friday. Chilling levels of harassment are posing a serious threat to schools. That's according to an independent government advisor. Ahead of a review to be published tomorrow, Dame Sarah Khan has revealed more than 75% of the public feel they have to refrain from speaking their mind. It suggests many people feel society has become more divisive and cites the case of a teacher who went into hiding after showing a caricature of the Prophet Muhammad during a class. It's understood the report will recommend a ban on protests within 150 metres of schools. And Simon Harris is expected to become the new leader of Ireland's Fine Gael party, later putting him on track to take over as the country's next prime minister. It follows the surprise resignation of Leo Varadkar on Wednesday for what he described as personal and political reasons. At the age of just 37, Mr Harris will become Ireland's youngest Taoiseach. He's expected to be formally elected in April after the Easter recess. Well, you can get more on all of our stories by signing up to GB News Alerts. The QR code is on your screen or our website has more details. Now, it's back to Michael.
Thank you very much, Aaron Armstrong. For decades, huge numbers of women have complained that changes to their pension age caught them unawares and resulted in delayed retirements or reduced benefits. Now, a report by the Parliamentary and Health Service Ombudsman says the changes weren't properly communicated and has recommended compensation for the affected women of up to almost £3,000. But the recommendation has raised eyebrows among a vocal group of younger observers, some saying it was the women's responsibility to understand their pension entitlements. To debate this, I'm joined by GB News's own Albi Amancona and political commentator and author uh, Joe Phillips. Uh, welcome to you both to this programme. Um, Joe. Um, the bare bones of this issue, please. So the bare bones are that this goes back to the mid-90s, when I think Kenneth Clark was actually the Chancellor. Mm. Um, so we knew that pension, a, the pension age, age of retirement, um, state pension, was going to have to go up at some point. Um, and so it rumbled on through various governments, umpteen chancellors and so on and so forth. And then we knew that the men's age was going to go up and the women's age, which had been 60, suddenly went from 60 to 66. And it was very badly communicated. I mean, I'm one of the women affected by this. Um, and there are millions and millions of women. And it, this isn't so much about compensation. It's about absolute incompetence at communicating something so very important. And it's had a huge impact on many, many women, um, some of whom assumed they were going to retire at 60. Um, that allows them to do other things, whether it's childcare for grandchildren or whether it's looking after older parents or retire um, or, you know, many other things that's their choice. It also makes a huge difference between, you know, if you're... Maybe you've got a bad back, let's say, or something like that. If you retire at um, 58, thinking, well, I'll take early retirement, but I'm going to get my pension when I'm 60, all of a sudden it's 66, so you've got another eight years before you get that pension. And it has been badly communicated. <clears throat> I'm not entirely sure that I agree with the idea of compensation to everybody, because some people have been, you know adversely affected much more than many others. Um, and I think also if you start a process of having to put appeals in, it will take longer than most of us have got left. <laughs> and it will cost more than it would to just give everybody, you know, a thousand pounds worth of premium bonds or something. I, I, I'm slightly puzzled by the amount. I mean, obviously this is historic and the pension mm. used to be less than it is today. But we're approaching a position where the, where the pension you know, the basic pension is going to be about £1,000 a month. Yes. So this idea that you give compensation of up to £3,000 for what appear to be quite major differences yes. in people's um, understanding and, 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 and their, their, their um, anticipation, um, it doesn't seem like a huge amount of money. No, it doesn't. And there, and there are many women who, uh, who have been part of the WASPy campaign who reckon that they have lost tens of thousands mm. of pounds in, you know, lost earnings, lost investments. You know, it has an impact on ability to get a mortgage, uh, you know, ability to get loans, all sorts of things. Um, and I think what it is, is it's an absolutely stunning failure of successive governments. Um, but, I mean, this came up in about 2005, 2006, um, when the government could have then, or the government then, could have done more about it. But it's sort of... It's disappeared into the background. And you can't help think... I wonder if it would have been the same if it had been men that suddenly had a six-year jump. If they staggered it, so if they'd said, OK, if you were born in 1956, it, you'll, it'll go up by a year, so you retire at 61, if you are born in... Mm -hmm. and so on. You know, it's <clears throat> been badly handled. But the interesting thing of the Ombudsman's report is that they put it straight before Parliament, and you know how this works, Michael, instead of it going round the houses before it's laid before Parliament. Because they have although they've had some cooperation with DWP, Department of Work and Pensions, the DWP has made it very clear that they will not cooperate. They resist it. So it's gone to Parliament straight away. Um, Albie, I'm sorry to keep waiting for so long. Thank you for your patience. What do you make of all this? Well, as someone who was born in the mid-90s, a lot of this happened before my time, at least before my time politically. And I think for a lot of younger people, they feel when they hear about the WASPy women 
Well, so what? The retirement age was equalised from 60 to 65. A lot of us think, well, actually, why was the state pension different for men and women in the first place? Some people think, well, if there was anyone that should get compensation, shouldn't it be the men that had to work for an extra five years for the whole time that the state pension wasn't equalised? Perhaps that's a conversation we should be having. But I think on the specific point about compensation, it is should this be a public spending priority? We've heard today from Jeremy Hunt, the Chancellor, that the Conservatives are going to commit to the triple lock on state pensions. The Labour Party will probably do that as well. This is a proportion of the population that already disproportionately gets a lot of public spending on health care, on social care, on pensions, on free bus passes, on other things. So is it really a public spending priority to give people, yes, there might have been an injustice, it could have been better communicated, but to give people compensation when actually a large proportion of taxpayers' money is already being spent on this part of the population when there are other groups in the population where money isn't being spent very much. And also, Michael, I'm sure you'll appreciate this a lot, we need to be spending a lot more on defence in this era where we're entering a, a period of a lot more unstable international relations. Is this really a public spending priority for a government in 2024? A lot of young people say no. It's interesting that you call them a part of the population. I mean, another way of looking at it is that it's a, it's a period through which everybody passes. Well, if they're lucky, everyone passes. So there are periods in your life where you consume quite a lot. I mean, school children consume an awful lot. You know, a lot of my taxes go towards uh, educating children. Then there'll be a period of your life where you are beginning to earn, where you're not getting so much from the state. And then there's a period when you're in ill health and you have more of the needs and you stop working because you're too old to work and the state intervenes and helps you in that period. Why do you call it a portion of the population rather than a stage of life through which, with luck, everybody passes? Because it is a part of the population. We can, we can get upset about semantics, Michael, but it is a part of the population which disproportionately benefits from taxpayers' money. Children are another part of the population. We're not talking about children today, we're talking about pensioners. And I'm not saying I have any uh, ill will towards my taxpayers' money going towards people who are dependents on the state. I think that is important. My point is, is whether or not a public spending priority is that we spend more money on a part of the population that already receives disproportionately a lot in taxpayer funding. Were you pleased that the um, Chancellor uh, cut national insurance contributions in the sense that that is something from which pensioners do not benefit because they don't pay national insurance contributions. Therefore, what's happening to pensioners is that with fiscal drag, they're being drawn more and more into taxation. It seems now that the basic pension will soon be drawn into taxation, even if that's your only income. Are you happy? Because that looks like the Chancellor trying to redress part of the problem that you're identifying. Look, I am a Tory. I support any tax cut. I think the national insurance tax cut was, was an interesting way to cut tax. But ultimately, with fiscal drag, as you mentioned, people are still paying more tax now than they have been in periods in the past. So whether or not it's actually a real terms tax cut is a different question. But even with the tax cuts that we have seen, Again, I would say, are there other public spending priorities that, could, that that money could have gone to, which wasn't a tax cut, for example, defence? I think we're going to be having a big conversation about defence in the 21st century, a conversation that we've not had maybe for 50, 100 years, in that we really do need to be spending more on defence in our tax cuts and topping up pensions, really going to be public spending priorities for either Conservative governments or Labour governments in the 21st century. It's also my tip that the Labour government may find itself the next Labour government may find itself dominated by the security and defence mm. issue. But, Joe, what do you make of this kind of intergenerational well, rivalry or unhappiness? I mean, I can, I can see the point from younger people's view. I mean, what is interesting, as you mm. and I know, um, people over 60 and over 65, t the turnout at the last election from that age group was about 77%. Under 30, it's about 53%. So the answer to young people is actually you need to get out, you need to get involved in politics, you need to be voting, you need to make your voice heard. But this, um, it's funny, isn't it? Pensioners are the only group of people that we define by the benefit 
that they receive, um, which is wrong because actually, you know, they are people, many of whom are still working. They might be retired teachers, they might be retired doctors, nurses, builders, you know, you name it. And yet we lump them into this group and somebody in their 60s who might be still working and very active is considerably different to somebody in their 90s in most cases. Um, and I think, you know, there's a great danger that we, and we've seen this, um, in fact, it was in the news, wasn't it? Aaron was referring to it, um, this division. We don't need division, but all politicians need to know you don't underestimate the Women's Institute. Remember what happened to Tony Blair? I do indeed. <laughs> and um, the, the WASPy campaign has uh, certainly achieved a considerable success with this opinion given by the Ombudsman. So thank you very much to Joe Phillips and Albi Amancona. After the break, was it a catastrophic blunder or an inspiring example of British pluck? We'll look back on the great escape 80 years later. Headliners. Tomorrow's papers tonight, every night from 11 p.m. Welcome back to Headliners. And Paul, we're going to get straight into Monday's mail for some good old fashioned traditional mail breastfeeding. Yeah. Uh, to answer the question, what is the latest woke hell, Josh? Uh, Row as hospitals say hormone filled milk from trans <laughs> women who were born male is just as good for a baby as the real thing. It's possible for men, if they pump themselves full of oestrogen, to grow larger breast tissue. And they often do... If or you just eat lots of burgers. But yeah, or... Yeah. <laughs> Easy bit, eh? Um, but... And once you've done that, it is, it is actually then possible to express or lactate some... A liquid. A liquid, OK? If to that liquid you then add another load of pills, medication, chemicals, whatever, that lactation juice can be fed to a baby. We don't really... This is not for the sake of the baby. The baby has no benefits from this whatsoever. The studies are very weak on it. Um, it's a bit worrying because, you know, when ho hospitals started indulging in, in homeopathy and having, a, you know, the NHS had homeo yeah. homeopathic um, hospitals, that was worrying because they're supposed to be a trusted authority. And before saying something like this, there should be an awful lot of study done. I want to show you this hospital. This is whether it's necessary. The University yeah, Hospital do. Sussex NHS Foundation Trust. That's who it is. And they have written one of the stupidest sentences sentences that I have read on, aloud read in the two years that I've been <laughs> privileged to do the show. It says, the term human milk is meant to be neutral and not gender biased. <laughs> yep. Wow. Yep. That's incredible. <laughs> yep. Oh, my God, we're laughing at you. I mean, and as someone says here, babies are not props. And that's the yep. scary thing. And no. when it's not when we're not focusing primarily on the health of a baby. No, but the uh, the, the, the feeling of a person doing it yeah. rather than it's, it's a bit of an odd way to go, isn't it? So. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels. We're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Big news, big debates, big opinion. Patrick Christie's Tonight is the week's biggest show. Every weekday, 9 to 11 p.m., we've got the inside track on the day's top stories. There'll be sharp takes you won't get anywhere else. We will set the news agenda, not just follow it, and I want to bring you along for the ride. Whatever it is, we'll have our finger on the pulse. It's news, but it's this close to entertainment. Patrick Christie's Tonight, 9 to 11 p.m., only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. Welcome back. 80 years ago tonight, hundreds of men prepared to break out of the German prisoner of war camp Stalag Luft III in Poland. The escape plan was immortalised in the 1963 movie The Great Escape, making cinema goers aware of the three tunnels dubbed Tom, Dick and Harry, dug by British Commonwealth and European prisoners. Will Hollis has been looking back on how they did it. During the Second World War, hundreds of thousands on both sides were taken captive as prisoners of war. British prisoners and their allies believed breaking out was their duty. 
The German Camp Stalag Luft III was designed to make that impossible. The story of an attempt 80 years ago today stands out against all others. The Great Escape. At Eden Camp in Moulton, North Yorkshire, the Modern History Museum is showing visitors how they did it. The Allies worked in tight, cramped conditions, digging three tunnels beneath the prison. You can only imagine what conditions were like deep underground, working in the dark, with discovery only a simple mistake away. A team working alongside the museum recreated the escape tunnel and the tools made to dig it. Summer O'Brien is the collections manager at the museum. The prisoners were very creative with what they did, so they made things such as this. So this is a spade and they would have used their everyday items and their rations that they received to create items such as this. Same as the tunnel, they used their bed slats. 76 prisoners got out before discovery. Only three avoided recapture. On Hitler's orders, 50 escapees were killed, a war crime. At the International Bomber Command Centre in Lincoln, the names of 28 of them are remembered on its memorial wall, including Canadian Gordon Kidder and Britain Thomas Kirby Green. There they were, escaped together, recaptured, murdered together and remembered together. Bob Ankerson is president of the RAF's XPOW Association and a volunteer at the centre. Captured during the First Gulf War, he later met men from the Great Escape. For those who escaped multiple times, they would be in solitary confinement for a significant length of time. But it didn't dull their determination to continue with their fight. A memorial is held at the tunnel site on the anniversary of the escape in Zhargan, what is now Poland, every year. Marek Lazarz is director of a museum at the site. As a historian, uh, it is our duty to remember every every anniversary of the Great Escape. The escape is celebrated in the classic 1963 film, with added drama for the cinema sometimes criticised. The true story, unchanged each year, is great enough. Will Hollis, GB News. Yes, Will Hollis there. So only three of those who escaped reached safety. The rest were recaptured and more than half of them were murdered. So was the plan a costly failure or an inspiring example of Britain's bulldog spirit? Here to answer is Guy Walters, historian and author of The Real Great Escape, and he also runs tours of Stalag Luft Camp. Uh, very good to see you, Guy. Well, what is the answer to that question? I mean, the, the death toll was appalling and only three made it to the safety. How does one assess the great escape? I think, uh, tediously, it's a little bit of both. It was a uh, you know, brilliant act of bravery, but at the same time, uh, it was a, a very costly failure. As you say, 50 men lost their lives. And you have to ask the big question, what difference to the war effort would it have made if these men had made it to Britain? Um, a lot of people say, oh, well, they're opening up a new front inside Germany. It's going to, you know, tie up the Germans. But it doesn't tie up the Germans. All it does, it just means that they um, have an enhanced security dragnet, if you like. And as they do so, they arrest another, you know, 14,000 escapers on the run from other camps. So actually, there's blowback. It's actually uh, counterproductive in the end. So, you know, it, it's very problematic because you don't want to insult you know, the bravery of these men, and you certainly don't want to belittle those who made the ultimate sacrifice uh, by escaping. Um, why was it such a failure? Um, I mean, assuming that, at least in this respect, the film is right, there was such care and attention given to clothing, uniforms, documentation, and so on, and yet nearly everyone was recaptured very, very quickly. Why did it fail well, in that I think respect? The film the film makes out that they all had fantastic disguises and brilliantly forged passes. But in truth, you know, they were wearing, uh, you know, clothes, you know, uh, overcoats with, you know, Savile Row tailor's marks still in them, which obviously the Germans could spot their suspicious. I mean, you know, that was almost as obvious as wearing a Garrick tie. And, and, I, and, and, then, and then you've also got the problem some of their passes had, were misspelt. Uh, you know, words like Leipzig were misspelt. Um, so they were very easy to pick up. And the weather at the moment, finally, well, at least down here in Wiltshire, it's a lovely spring day, March the 24th. But March the 24th, 1944, 
in Silesia was bitterly cold. And these chaps were wearing, you know, the equivalent of kind of like chinos and a basic tunic, almost kind of like what I'm wearing here. Um, and, and they got exhausted. They made mistakes. They stuck out like a sore thumb. And, and I think part of the problem is 50% of the escapers were, were English or British. And people who are British just look very British at times. And so, you know, there's a chap been in the papers recently called Desmond Plunkett, who thought that the escape was betrayed. But if you look at a picture of Desmond Plunkett, just Google it, you can't look more British than Desmond Plunkett. Um, so you just stick out. So basically, it was their exhaustion. You know, the papers are wrong, the uniforms are wrong, civilian clothes are wrong. So ultimately, it was a, a bit of a glorious failure. We heard a moment ago about the general motivation for people to escape. The, um, the, those who'd been imprisoned thought it was their duty to escape. What about the particularity of this prison camp? Why was there such uh, an impetus here to escape? And why was it organised on such a colossal basis? I, I need to pick up on this thing. There was no formal duty to escape. Uh, there never was in the King's regulations at the Times. They felt it was their duty to escape in the sense that they felt, uh, you know, you should be brave. But only a third of POWs wanted to escape. We tend to think that, you know, like the movie, everyone's in an escape hungry, you know, desperate to do their bit. Two thirds of chaps thought, you know what, that barbed wire represents security to me. I'm going to sit it out. Um, but there were a third of chaps um, who, you know, the others called the hearties, who were very keen to, to feel that they should be doing their bit. And it was a great way of keeping your mind occupied. Of course, today we are much more savvy and sensitive to matters about mental health. But then, you know, you had the Red Cross going into POW camps and issuing reports saying these chaps are in a bad way mentally. Um, and actually, you know, by forging some passes or trying to modify a great coat or digging a tunnel actually is a great way of keeping yourself occupied. So even if you'd think, I'm never going to make it home, it's going to make no difference to the war effort. You know, as one pilot, you know, said to me, I just wanted to see a little bit more of Germany before the war was over. And, I, you know, I felt that was a pretty good reason for escaping, you know, keep your mind going. If you tour Stalag Luft three with one of your tours, perhaps, what do you learn? What, what, come, what comes home to you about this? I think what really comes home to you, if you join my tour, uh, is that you are stuck in a very miserable forest in the middle of Silesia. Um, and you've got to imagine what it must have been like for a chap in his early 20s who two nights ago was flying a Spitfire uh, and then he was going to the pub to see his girlfriend... Uh, this is what pilots have, unlike, you know, ground troops or people in the Navy. You know, they're in and out of the battle zone in hours. Um, and I think the culture shock that they had suddenly to go from Surrey to Silesia was huge. And I think that really comes across. And, of course, uh, you know, that you still see the ruins of the huts from where the escape took place. So, you know, you really do walk in the footsteps of the great escapers. And when I take the tour, uh, you know, I walk through the woods the way they went to the station. So, you know, I drag people along, Michael. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm a hard taskmaster. And, and just kind of yes or no, I'm kind of assuming that there is no equivalent of the Steve McQueen figure in reality. None whatsoever. There's a motorbike in the town which you can jump on, but other than that, no, I'm afraid. Sorry about that. Guy Walters, most interesting. Thank you so much. In a few minutes, we're going to analyse the fallout from that brutal terrorist attack in Moscow. Before then, your main headlines with Aaron Armstrong. Hey, it's exactly half past 12. I'm Aaron Armstrong in the GB newsroom. Islamic State's released new footage which appears to back up the terror group's claim it was behind Friday's attack in Moscow. Russians are observing a national day of mourning after at least 133 people died. It's worst attack for two decades. With well, a new video released by IS show gunmen filming themselves and moving through the venue searching for people. We've chosen not to show it. President Putin has suggested without evidence uh, Ukraine was involved, despite the claim from Islamic State of its responsibility, that claim backed up by US intelligence, uh, and Ukraine itself has dismissed Russia's claims as absurd. The White House has condemned the attack as heinous and has described Islamic State as an, a common terrorist enemy that must be defeated.
The sound there of Ukraine being hit by a series of Russian attacks overnight. Residents were forced to take shelter in subway stations. And missiles also struck critical infrastructure in the west of the country, near Lviv, uh, breaching the border with Poland, uh, which is a NATO member. At least 10,000 civilians have been killed in Ukraine since Russia's invasion. The Prince and Princess of Wales have said they're enormously touched by messages of support they've received following Catherine's cancer diagnosis. She revealed on Friday that she started treatment. A statement from Kensington Palace uh, said the couple are grateful the public understand their request for privacy. And the Chancellor's defended the government's record on affordable housing after claiming £100,000 a year is not a huge salary. Jeremy Hunt says it doesn't go as far as you'd think for people in his Surrey constituency because of higher house prices and the rising cost of living. The average home now costs uh, around eight times the average income. It was half that in the 1990s. And sign up to GB News Alerts by scanning the QR code on your screen for more, or you can find the details at gbnews.com slash alerts. And Michael will be back with you after this short break. Nana Queer. Weekends from 3pm. OK, this is getting beyond ridiculous. Trans women, which, as we know, are biological males, are apparently now going to be included as women in a push to get more female chief executives into the FTSE 100 by it next year. Now, the campaign called 25 by 25 is an initiative headed by Chief Executive Tara Kemelin jones whose mission is to get 25 female chief executives running blue-chip companies by 2025, and it's backed by major companies including Unilever, NatWest and BP. You couldn't make this up. Tara said anyone who identifies as a woman is a woman. What's the point, seriously? If anyone can say that they're a woman, then why bother with this at all? It just makes a mockery of the whole thing. Will the trans woman have a salary of a man or a woman? As we know, there are still major gender pay gap inequalities and it will be a complete misrepresentation of women or, and on boards of pay and average salaries. Only last month, Tory MPs accused the financial services watchdog, the FCA, of putting women's rights at risk by encouraging banks to collect staff data based on self-identified gender rather than biological sex. Of course, it was met with resistance from some 40 MPs and peers who wrote to the Chancellor to argue that the FCA was taking an activist approach to its diversity policies. This morning, I read about a school, a health nurse who claimed that not all people who have babies might call themselves a she or a woman or a mum. She said that walking through a school in a skirt and letting your hair grow when actually people previously knew you as a boy, well, that's incredibly brave. That's what she said. But I think there's an element of attention-seeking, if I'm totally honest. But the worry is it could lead to a path of medical transition where most people going through puberty are struggling with their gender identity in any case. Biology trumps ideology, and it's time to take a stand. I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Gloria DiPiero, bringing you... PMQ's Live here on GB News. Whenever Parliament is in session on a Wednesday at midday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's questions. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister. And we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's Live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels. We're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Welcome back. This week has been Shakespeare week, with schools throughout the country getting involved in activities to learn more about Britain's most celebrated bard. But as children learn about his plays, some theatres have started to give audiences 
trigger warnings ahead of performances, informing them about themes such as violence, racism and misogyny. Our West Midlands reporter, Jack Carson, has this report. Uneasy lies the head that wears the crown. But for William Shakespeare, retaining his status as Britain's most celebrated bard has been seemingly light work. 1,700 of the words he invented are still part of our language today. And this week has all been about continuing that legacy within the community. Shakespeare Week is celebrating a decade of giving primary school aged children opportunities to enrich themselves in the work of the man from Stratford. As Charlotte Scott, director of knowledge at the Shakespeare Birthplace Trust explains. Well, the last 10 years have been spectacular as we started to grow a programme that was really about creating an incredibly positive experience for children to access Shakespeare where language isn't a barrier, where it's fun, where it's playful and over the last 10 years that programme has grown. I think what's important as well is that we allow children to explore some of those adult themes in ways that they are informed and enabled so that they can still encounter uh, ideas that are related to the adult world but in safe spaces and in ways that are inclusive and imaginative. More recently, adult themes within Shakespeare have been the topic of debate, with both actor Ray Fiennes and Culture Secretary Lucy Fraser calling for an end of the increasing number of trigger warnings on the Bard's plays. Fiennes says people should be shocked and disturbed by the theatre, but what are those in Shakespeare's hometown of Stratford make of the recent trend? Uh, I think that's an overreaction. No need for it at all. Absolutely ridiculous. You just have to understand how the world was when those plays and works were written. Um, there was no offence meant, it was just how it was. And you can't rewrite history. The woke brigade spoiling everything. I think that's a good idea because things have changed, standards have improved, values have improved. So, yeah, let's not offend. To warn or not to warn. That is the question. But Shakespeare Week has opened the door for the next generation to continue the Bard's everlasting legacy. Jack Carson, GB News, Stratford-upon-Avon. Yeah, thank you, Jack Carson. While many of us are deeply moved by the poise and dignity of the Princess of Wales as she revealed that she is receiving treatment for cancer, but dignity has been sadly lacking elsewhere, and this busts me a moment to reflect on the wild and deeply unkind speculation about her whereabouts and health on social media in recent weeks. Alexander Larman has been considering that in the pages of The Spectator, and he joins me now. Uh, Alex, what is your reflection on the way that people have behaved? Good morning, Michael. Well, I think that I speak for everybody here when the news of... Kate's condition broke on Friday evening and it was a visceral shock to hear this young woman talking about this awful ordeal that she's going through. And I think we have to remember that she was more or less coerced into having to make this statement because of the rumours about her condition on social media were so baroque and so absurd that eventually she was forced into a situation where, presumably undergoing treatment and presumably not in the best of health conditions, she had to actually address the nation put the rumours to, to bed. I mean, that's an extraordinary thing to be forced to do. And of course, the worst part is it hasn't even worked. I mean, there are lots of these social, social media accounts which are just saying, oh, it's all been made up. She's just doing it for attention. And you start to think to yourself, do you have so little compassion and so little understanding of what she must be going through? But you see everything in terms of cynicism and in terms of this horribly vitriolic response. But this is what we've seen over the last few weeks, isn't it? We've seen this endless parade of tittle-tattle and rumour and gossip. But of course, it's not just limited to people on social media. I mean, it is in, in every single English language speaking country. It's been the, the main topic of conversation. I mean, I've been getting emails from leading publishers and people like that talking about it. And it's not just the usual suspects. And of course, what's so disturbing is that there's a real sense that, um, you know, we are heading into something awful now. Uh, Alex, even so-called respectable commentators um, made the point that they thought the palace had not ha uh, handled the PR very well. As we reflect now, with the new knowledge that we have, can we say that actually the palace had no option but to handle the PR in the way that it did, 
because it had been overwhelmed by a very significant new piece of information about the princess's condition. And the princess has made it very clear why she didn't want to communicate that, taking into account the needs of her children. I think that if you're referring to that photoshopped picture that she puts out on Mother's Day, that was a very poor piece of media handling, because I think that was something which was obviously decided upon far too quickly, and it wasn't done very well, because ultimately, if you go to photoshop a picture like that, you have to do so in such a way that the leading photo agencies don't then send out a kill notice, because that's the kind of thing which gets people saying, I mean, there was one royal commentator who said, I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but... And as soon as people who theoretically shouldn't be saying things like that are being driven to say things like that, then obviously it makes the situation infinitely worse. But the problem the royal family has had is that Prince William, I think much more so than his father, is a great believer in the never complain, never explain idea, because he's not a man who likes the media. He's not a man who's comfortable with the media. And so the idea is he, he would want to protect his wife, and he would try and ensure that his PR machine was dedicated to putting out as little as possible. But what we've seen is there really is a conflict between the demands that people have to hear about the health of the royal family. And I mean, they are demands, there's no other way of of describing it, with the privacy that a woman undergoing cancer that a young family deserves. And I think everybody who's got any kind of heart would be absolutely appalled at some of the rumours that are still circulating. But on the other hand, the genie's out of the bottle now. I mean, what else can you do? Uh, Alex Larman, uh, thank you very much. Uh, And of course, uh, I certainly said my... Warmest good wishes to the Princess of Wales. Now, Dawn Neeson will be taking over at one o'clock. Um, I rather assume that you'll have something about the Princess on your programme as we, well. We will be talking about it, but what I'd like to do... Uh, 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 someone in my own family uh, was diagnosed with cancer exactly two years ago today. Uh, thankfully, touch wood, they are doing well and they're in recovery. So what I'm trying to do, Michael, is, is make it positive, is to to get the message out that there is hope. You know, once upon a time, a diagnosis of cancer was a death sentence. Now it isn't necessary. so, and I agree with you entirely, you know, your, your hearts and your, your thoughts and your prayers go to Catherine, um, William, and obviously the children, the whole family indeed. But we have got a, a lady on, a cancer survivor, talking about the positive things that are, have been achieved with modern day medicine. But we have got some good fun coming up on the show as well, including, have you got the time? I've got the place. Oh, right. Mm. There's a clue for us. <laughs> so, Dawn Neeson will be here <laughs> at uh, one o'clock. Um, stay with us now, as in a few minutes, we'll look at the implications of that terrorist attack in Moscow. Hello, here's your latest weather update from the Met Office for GB News. Today looks much better, with plenty of sunshine across much of the UK, certainly a much brighter day than on Saturday. That's all thanks to a little ridge of high pressure moving in from the west, with low pressure now moving off uh, to the east of the UK. But notice further weather systems gathering out towards the west, and that will turn things more unsettled once again during the week ahead. Back to the detail now for the rest of the day. So plenty of sunshine around, just one or two showers feeding down from the north or northwest, particularly across northern parts of Scotland. Still a bit wintry here across the hilltops. But with lighter winds generally, more in the way of sunshine around, it should feel warmer out and about with temperatures up to 12 or 13 Celsius. 13 in London is 55 in Fahrenheit. As we go through the evening and during the overnight period, towards the north and east we'll see a lot of clear weather, the showers fading, turning quite chilly here with those clear spells. And without towards the west, it's starting to turn pretty wet, particularly across Northern Ireland, parts of Wales and the southwest of England, some heavy bursts of rain in places here by Monday morning. Temperatures down to two or three Celsius towards the north and east, so I say there will be a touch of frost by Monday morning. Was that towards the west, those temperatures start to rise, but that heralds a pretty wet day out across the west, and particularly down towards the southwest of England, could be some quite heavy rain at times here. And notice as that rain moves into colder air across Scotland, it will start to turn to snow, particularly on modest hills above about two or three hundred metres. Could be a fair bit of snow here tomorrow night, with some heavy rain towards the east and southeast of the country too. Brighter skies down towards the southeast with 12 degrees. Big news, big debates, big opinion. Patrick Christie's tonight is the week's biggest show. Every weekday, 9 to 11 p.m., we've got the inside track on the day's top stories. There'll be sharp takes you won't get anywhere else. We will set the news agenda, not just follow it, and I want to bring you along for the ride. Whatever it is, we'll have our finger on the pulse. It's news, but it's this close to entertainment. Patrick Christie's tonight, 9 to 11 p.m., only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. 
I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes and Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. Uh, welcome back. The death toll in that brutal terrorist attack in Moscow is said to stand at at least 133. Islamic State K has claimed responsibility for the atrocity, but that hasn't stopped Russian President Vladimir Putin from trying to link it to Ukraine, claiming that the attackers planned to reach the border across which they had negotiated passage with the Kiev government. Here to provide some analysis is Russia's security expert Adam Yor. Adam, welcome back to the programme. Um, did it take you by surprise that this attack, which appears to be very clearly uh, ISIS-K, uh, has been linked by Putin to Ukraine? Did that surprise you? Good afternoon. First of all, I'd just like to start by expressing my condolences. This is to the people concerned in this. It's a real awful human tragedy. As you say, 133 people uh, now said to have lost their lives in that, and 152 people are injured, according to the latest figures that the Russian government has put out. In terms of the way that the Russian government has responded to this, I'm not surprised. I think the immediate reaction from other analysts watching the situation would be, was that the Russian government and the Russian authorities will be very quick to try and implicate Ukraine in that. That was the fear among, as I said, many observers, and I imagine the British government. What happened is that very quickly, uh, military bloggers and uh, other media associated with the Russian state and who support Putin very quickly started to undermine any connection that ISIS was involved in this. That started very quickly after the attack on Friday evening and gathered pace through Friday night into Saturday morning. And yes, they were left in a situation where Putin himself clearly pointed the finger at Ukrainian involvement. Why does Putin take a while to uh, react to situations like this? I think it was the best part of 24 hours, wasn't it, before he said anything. Is that because he's kind of trying to work out which lie to tell? I don't think so. Following the way that the media and information space worked very quickly after the attack, I think the Russian authorities and supporters of Putin and people who control the media that promote his regime were very quick to build up a information space and information platform, planting material in various sources, which then fed into state media and into what Putin said in terms of, as I said, undermining the ISIS link, which has been put forward by Western media and also Western governments, and trying to, as I say, point the finger at, at Ukraine. So. I don't think that was hesitation myself. My sense is that that was a carefully coordinated and in some ways quite effective media operation by the Russian state and its proxies. Um, do you think Putin in any way felt vulnerable that he could be accused of having ignored warnings that were given to him by the Americans? I think there is a part of that as well. We have talked about Putin using this in order to mobilize public sentiment, gather support, uh, further support for his actions in Ukraine and in intensifying 
aggression there. I think a large part of this as well is to deflect attention from the seemingly obvious faults of the Russian security services, their inability to defend innocent Russian civilians, despite the warnings that were clearly passed on from the US government. Uh, there were air raids yesterday uh, on uh, Kiev and on Lviv. Um, do you imagine we're going to see a general intensification of the war uh, by Russia against Ukraine? It's very hard to predict what happens next. I think the pattern is, is that the war will intensify. We have seen a, a spike in violence and attacks over the, the past couple of days. I think it's very difficult to foresee exactly how Putin responds to the tragedy, to the attack in Moscow and how he implicates that. Um, the, the fear among many observers, uh, and I think among the Ukrainian government, is that there are precedents in the past. That if you look at the attacks in 1999 on civilians in Moscow and in other cities around Russia, that was a basis on which Putin launched a very severe wave of violence in Chechnya and was actually the basis for his first presidency. I know we talked about the elections last week, but regardless of who was responsible for the attacks in 1999, Beg your pardon. That was a, a a real foundation on which Putin started his rule, and to some extent, we could use that as a, a, a stepping stone, a really, to see where he goes from here. Why would ISIS K attack people in Moscow? That is a difficult question. I'm afraid I'm not a, an ISIS expert, so. I, I, I don't have any information into that. As, a, as we said, the US government did seemingly have intelligence that ISIS was uh, uh, preparing an attack on possibly a concert hall or a, a public space. The US intelligence community does have a duty to inform, so it is obligated to pass on information and intelligence about attacks to anyone who might be threatened uh, by that. And that does include governments which you might not like. So uh, it, I think it is clear that the US government did pass on information about uh, the potential threat of an uh, attack to the Russians. I think the question is, for the Russian government, why didn't they respond to that? Uh, and Russia has been involved, as you mentioned, in Chechnya, and Russia has been involved in Syria. So Russia has been involved in conflicts where ISIS uh, and ISIS-K uh, have an interest. What would you say of the mood in Moscow at the moment, Adam? The immediate mood, I, I think, understandably, is one of shock uh, and mourning. We've seen uh, billboards with candles all throughout the city and other parts of the country. We have seen people all around Russia and also in other parts of the temporary occupied territories in Ukraine, filing to leave messages of support and condolence. Russia is uh, is no stranger to these types of attacks. I know the, the last serious attack of this nature was a long time ago. Um, my immediate understanding, like I said, it is one of shock. Uh, I think just that the questions will be for us in terms of how the Russian government goes forward on this and potentially exploits that public sentiment. Adam, Adam, Adam Yule, thank you very much indeed. Well, on that sad note, I'm afraid that's uh, all from me for this week. I do hope you enjoy the rest of your weekend. Thank you for joining us today and I'll see you in one week's time. Look forward to it very much. Looks like things are heating up. Boxed Boilers, sponsors of weather on GB News. Hello, here's your latest weather update from the Met Office for GB News. We've seen a much quieter day across the UK today, more in the way of sunshine than on Saturday, but things will turn more unsettled again during the week ahead. It's this little ridge of high pressure that's been moving in from the west, quietening the weather down, but notice low pressure gathering again out towards the west, and so this will be turning things more unsettled through uh, tonight into Monday. 
As we go through the evening and overnight period then, the showers towards the north and east of the UK will tend to ease. We'll see lots of clear weather around, and here it will turn quite chilly with a touch of frost by Monday morning. Whereas out towards the west and southwest, that rain is gathering. Some of the rain starting to turn quite heavy by the morning on Monday, accompanied by quite blustery winds too. But notice an increase in temperature out towards the west as that rain arrives. Into Monday then, uh, plenty of bright weather towards the north and east of the UK, one or two showers up towards the far northeast, still a bit wintry in nature here, but elsewhere it's all about the wet and windy weather moving in from the west and southwest. So many western and southwestern parts of the UK, particularly down towards the southwest, seeing some very heavy rain at times on Monday. And as that rain moves into colder air in Scotland, we could see some snow falling, particularly during the afternoon into the overnight period. And again, some of that snow above about two or three hundred metres could be quite heavy in nature, with heavy rain towards the south and east of Scotland. That sets the scene for a very unsettled day across Scotland on uh, Tuesday. Again, heavy snow across the hills, heavy rain towards lower levels. Elsewhere, a mix of sunshine and showers. And that sets the scene for the rest of the week ahead. All areas seeing unsettled weather, showers are longer spells of rain, with temperatures near average. That warm feeling inside from Boxed Boilers. Sponsors of weather on GB News. There's still time to win our giveaway packed with seasonal essentials. First, there's an incredible £12,345 in tax-free cash to be won. Cash to make your bank account bloom. Plus a spring shopping spree with £500 in shopping vouchers to spend in the store of your choice. And finally, a garden gadget package including a handheld games console, a portable smart speaker and a pizza oven. For another chance to win the vouchers, the treats and £12,000,